Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming along this lunchtime to our latest webinar. I'm Catherine Foote. For those of you that don't know me, I'm director of Phoenix Insights. We're a relatively new think tank, part of Phoenix Group, the UK's largest long-term savings and retirement business. And we're essentially a longevity think tank. We've been set up to catalyze the big changes that we think are needed across society if more of us are going to be able to have decent financial security and well-being across what are now significantly longer lives than previous generations. And we're here today to share with you our latest research that we've carried out in partnership with the excellent Frontier Economics. The report's called Great Expectations, and it uses data from our own data set that we call the Longer Lives Index, drawn from almost uh, 16 and a half thousand adults across the UK. A huge data set and a huge opportunity to interrogate it for a deeper understanding of people's own uh, expectations and experiences as they journey to and through retirement. In this data, in this report today, what we've done is we've asked people what retirement income they expect and looked at their answers against the Pensions and Lifetime Saving Association's retirement living standards to understand how adequate these retirement income expectations are for a decent standard of living for those people in retirement. And we've then used what they tell us about their incomes and their saving behaviors to model whether or not they're actually on track to get the income in retirement they say they expect. Spoiler alert, you might perhaps not be surprised to hear, lots of us look like we're gonna be in for quite a nasty shock. And, and then finally, what we've done is modeled what impact two really often cited answers to this problem of undersaving uh, could have for people saving more and working longer. We've got some fantastic speakers uh, here today. First up, I'm going to be handing over to Rowena Crawford, who's a consultant at Frontier Economics and who uh, led the research with us. She'll take us through the findings. I'll then briefly just reflect on some of the key implications of these findings as I, as I see them personally. And then I'll hand over um, to two colleagues. First, Stephen Evans, who's chief executive at the Learning and Work Institute. And he's going to be commenting particularly on those issues around supporting people to work longer. And then last but not least, we've got Nigel People, director of policy and advocacy at the Pensions and Lifetime Savings Association. And he's going to be commenting in particular on issues around saving more. So as George said at the start, please do um, submit your questions in the chat. Do say who they're for, if they're for a particular panelist, please. And as chair, I'll be able to see all your questions and I'll try and get through as many as I can after we've heard from all our speakers. That's the plan for today. So thanks again for coming. And let me hand over now to Rowena to talk you through the headline findings from the report. Thank you very much for that introduction, Catherine. Um, as Catherine said, this report looks at um, the retirement income expectations of people and how um, adequate and achievable they are. And this has actually been a really interesting piece of work, uh, particularly for me. I mean, adequacy of retirement saving has obviously been talked about many, many times before. But what's really interesting of what we can do with this uh, Phoenix Insight data that Catherine mentioned is that we can look at people's own individual expectations rather than just what they might achieve in retirement and how they compare to some um, standard thresholds, if you like, for what people need to save for retirement. Retirement's a very individualistic thing. What people need very much depends on uh, their working life circumstances, what they're used to having, what, they're, what kind of retirement they aspire to have. And therefore, being able to look explicitly at what people expect and how achievable that is, uh, is really quite an exciting opportunity. So if I can have my first slide, I'll, I'll launch straight in um, with what we found. Um, so, as Catherine kind of alluded to, there are reasons to be concerned actually about the vast majority of people that uh, are saving in a defined contribution pension or who could be saving in a defined contribution pension. Um, I should say up front, just for clarity, um, the sample of people we're looking at here, uh, we're excluding people currently saving in defined benefit pensions and, and looking at everybody else. Um, and we group people into, into five categories uh, here, and that's what this, this little chart shows you on the left-hand side. Um, so when people are asked what retirement income they expect, um, technically after housing costs and after taxation, 
you get 19% of people that aren't able to answer that question. So that's the first group that we've separated out. That's a group we've, we've termed the unsure. Now, clearly, not all of these people um, will be financially unprepared for retirement. Um, and some people are just behaviorally less disposed to guessing at an answer that's inherently uncertain. But I think there are reasons to be concerned about some of this group that actually some people would benefit from being a bit more engaged in their pension saving. And it's striking, we look in the report in more detail about exactly the characteristics of all of these groups. It's striking that this group is not just all younger people a long way from retirement. You get people across the age spectrum, actually middle and later working life people represented amongst this group. So it's not just that retirement is a long way away and these people don't need to engage with financial planning. Amongst people that do report an expected uh, retirement income, um, about 15% of people report expecting an income that's lower than what the Pensions and Lifetime Savings Association uh, would call a minimum income. So for those of you that don't know, the PSLA have produced uh, three retirement living standards. So that's essentially um, three different standards of living, baskets of goods and services that people might aspire to have in retirement. And they've worked out how much income you would need to purchase those different uh, levels of, of living standards. Um, and the minimum standard, their lowest standard, is an income required to uh, provide yourself with uh, basic necessities and then have a little bit left over um, for a bit of fun on top of that. Now we find that 15% of all DC savers are reporting expecting an income in retirement of less than that amount. Um, so that's the group we're, we're terming the financially struggling. And I think you'd agree with me that that's a group that's of course for concern. We'd like to live in a society where everybody can afford to have more than just the basic necessities once they're in retirement. Um, so, as Catherine mentioned, another part of what we do, we don't just look at what income people expect in retirement, but we, we also model how li likely they are to get that. And we do that using the, the breadth of detailed data available in the survey. We look at how much wealth they've got at the moment. We look at their current savings rates and we extrapolate that saving behavior forward through to the future. Uh, and we know what age they plan to retire. So we work out how much wealth they're likely to accumulate by that point and whether that would be sufficient to pay for their expected income throughout the whole of their retirement. So for those people that expect above the PSLA minimum income, actually um, a lot of people don't uh, are not on track for the income they expect. And in fact, 40% of all DC savers expect more than that minimum income, but aren't on track to get there. And that's the group that we're calling the under savers in this chart here. So there's a cause for concern there because this group it risks being disappointed in retirement. They might get there and realise they can't afford the retirement income that they're expecting at the moment. So then of the people that are left, people that are expecting more than the minimum income in retirement and they're on track to get there, um, there's a group within that who actually report that the living standard that that income would allow them to support in retirement is lower than the income standard they'll have before retirement. And that, that's the group we're calling the downgraders here people that are on track to get the income they expect, but that will represent a fall in their standards of living. And typically we think people want to avoid that. So there's a cause for concern there. And about 12% of all DC savers are in that group. And that leaves the final group that we've, we've separated out in our categorization, what we've called the happily on track. These are the minority of uh, DC pension savers that are expecting a reasonable income in retirement. They're on track to get there and that would allow them to um, not have a fall in their living standards when they come to retire. So that means the other 86% of, of DC pension savers, there's a reason to be concerned there, either because they're not sufficiently engaged with their pension saving to know what income they might expect, because they're expecting a very low income, because they're not on track for the income they expect, or because they are on track and that income uh, would still result in a fall of their living standards. And I won't talk about it so much now, but if you're interested in the report, we've dug more in more detail into uh, the characteristics of these uh, different five groups. And you find people from all walks of life, all different circumstances in, in each of these categories, um, but also that working life resources, unsurprisingly, are very important. Uh, lower income people uh, disproportionately in the financially struggling group, uh, the higher income people uh, disproportionately are happily on track and the undersavers and downgraders, um, downgraders sorry, concentrated in, in middle income people. So then in the, in the research, we moved on to thinking about, well, 
if people aren't on track for the retirement income they expect, what changes in behaviour uh, could they do and would that help them get the income that they're expecting? So we focused on the undersavers and the um, the proportion of them financially struggling that aren't on track for the income they expect. And we've looked at changes in their savings behaviour, changes in how long they tend, tend to work and whether that would help them uh, get on track. So if I could have the next slide, uh, please, thinking about the first of those. First, what about you know, working working longer, that means that you can uh, potentially save for more years. You've got fewer years of retirement that you need to finance. Um, could working longer mean that people get the retirement income they expect? Well, we looked at a couple of simulations here. We looked at what happens if everybody works two years longer than they currently intend. Um, that would only actually bring 8% of people that aren't on track back on track for the income they expect. Um, if you do a different scenario, you take everybody that's currently planning to retire before age 68 and you say all of you people work until age 68, uh, that has a bigger effect, but still only 20% of people that aren't currently on track would be brought on track for the retirement income they expect. And if you look at um, who these changes in behaviour make more difference for, um, actually that last scenario makes the most difference for people that are on higher salaries and who are younger. And the reason for that is explained by the chart on the right. If you look at average retirement age expectations, people on higher salaries um, and of younger ages are typically planning to retire slightly earlier than people on lower salaries or people uh, that are already older. And therefore, if you're simulating that everybody stays working till 68, that actually makes a bigger difference to the length of working life for people on higher salaries um, and people that are currently further from retirement. So what about saving more? If I could have the next slide, please. Again, um, you know, somewhat disappointingly, as Catherine alluded to, actually modest increases in saving rates um, are not going to be sufficient for most people uh, to get them on track for the income they expect. Obviously, it would still improve their financial situation. They would have more income in retirement than they would if they didn't increase their saving rates, but it's not going to be sufficient to get them to the income that they currently expect. So two scenarios in particular we modelled, what if everybody increases their saving rate by 2% of salary? Um, that only brings about 5% of people who are not on track to be on track. And we looked at what happens if everybody that's currently saving less than 12% of salary in total between them and their employer, if applicable. Um, if everybody increased their savings to that level, uh, that would bring about 17% of people on track. Um, so, you know, moves a fair proportion of the people, but by no means, by no means everybody. And perhaps the, one of the clearest ways of showing the reason for that is, is this graph on the right. Now, what this does is it takes the group of people that aren't on track for the retirement income they expect. And the set of bars on the left shows you their current savings rate. So about 54% of people are either not saving at all or are saving uh, less than 4% of salary in a defined contribution pension. And then the set of bars on the right shows you how that maps to what savings rate they would need um, from today until they retire in order to get the income you expect. And you can see that there are big increases in saving required here. So the, the majority of people would need saving in excess of 20% of their salary each year going forward. Um, for 40, over 40% 40 of people would need saving in excess of half their salary every year. So there are substantial increases in saving that are needed. Um, and I don't think it's particularly controversial for a lot of people that's not going to be uh, achievable. So if I could have the next slide, please. So where does that leave us? Um, well, we looked at combining these scenarios. Um, if you require everybody to save at least 12% of their salary and work to 68, um, that obviously improves things more, but it still only gets 40% of people uh, on track for the retirement income they expect if they're not currently on track. Now, other sources of income might help. So in our modeling, we've looked at uh, their current wealth and their pension saving and their, their wider saving for the purposes of, of retirement income. Um, so other sources like inheritances, inheritances sorry, or planning to use housing wealth might help. Um, but it's worth noting that's not expected by everybody. And actually, it's more commonly ex expected amongst people that are already on track than amongst people that are not on track for the retirement income they expect. So there's you know, some inequalities there. Another way of looking at this question is to look at how the retirement incomes people expect compare to those that are being uh, received by the current generation of pensioners. Um, 
And that's what this little table at the bottom here does. So I mentioned that the PSLA have, have three retirement living standards. Um, so here this table looks at the proportion of people that are expecting uh, incomes of at least uh, each of those thresholds. So, for example, about 82 percent of people are expecting an income of at least the minimum level. Um, 60 percent of people were expecting an income of the moderate or high level and a third of people expecting uh, a comfortable or higher. If you look at how that compares to what's received by current pensioners, um, a similar proportion of people actually get an income that's um, above the minimum level. But you only have 37 percent of people on an income of the moderate or higher level and only 11 percent of people um, on an income that's uh, achieving the current comfortable standard of living. So there are quite big differences between uh, the living standards that current working age people expect or the incomes they expect to have in retirement and what's enjoyed by current pensioners. Now, you would expect some differences there. There are differences between generations. Um, current working age people have typically had uh, higher uh, lifetime earnings than people that are already in retirement. And therefore, you would expect probably uh, on average uh, incomes in retirement maybe to go up, um, but not, I don't think, to, to the extent that is implied here by these expectations. So that is suggestive that, you know, while we can't pin down exactly how many people are unrealistic in their expectations, it does look like there's a, a general sense of um, people expecting incomes in retirement that might perhaps not be achievable. And if I could have my final slide, I'll just um, pull out a couple of um, observations in terms of who the groups are that one might be perhaps most concerned about. Um, so one group of interest um, is people on lower uh, incomes at the moment. Now, actually, most of these people, they're not, they're not expecting comfortable standards of living in retirement. Um, the vast majority of people are expecting um, either minimum or moderate incomes in retirement. And actually, our modelling suggests that they would be largely on track uh, for the most part if they save 12% of salary in a pension and if they work to 68. But that still represents an increase in saving rates for these, uh, for these groups. And I think there's a question there about, OK, while we can model it and it says they're on track, is that actually uh, feasible, particularly um, with increases in um, inflation at the moment, increases in cost of necessities in particular, um, whether or not increases in saving um, is really plausible for these groups. The other group that um, I'd, I'd highlight for attention to um, is middle income earners, where a lot of people do expect some of the higher uh, PSLA living standards. Um, but what our modelling shows here is that actually a lot of them would need not just small changes, but substantial changes in their savings rates if they're going to achieve that, even if they work through to 68. So I think, although, as Catherine said, a lot of the focus has been around uh, savings rates and length of working lives until now, I think there is also a question or you know, a discussion to be had around people's expectations as well. And that actually a lot of people might benefit from much greater clarity about what closing the gap between what they currently expect and what they're on track to achieve would actually entail. And therefore, you know, greater appreciation of are those are they changes they want to make or are, do expectations also um, merit the revisiting as well? So I will stop there and um, hand over to Catherine to draw out more of the um, implications of this. Thanks, Rowena. That's super. Um, I might actually, and a slight diversion of, of what I said was the plan, just ask you, Rowena, if, if you don't mind, to just clarify a couple of small points that have come through um, in the chat. Um, one is just to clarify the trajectory of income that's assumed um, for people as they progress in our modelling. And um, just to clarify the 12% um, being based on including the company contributions or solely individual contributions. Just a quick reaction response to those two points, Rowena, if you don't mind. No, not at all. So the 12% that we're talking about is a total uh, contribution to pension. Um, so that's inclusive of employer contributions if you get them. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's that's uh, what that is. In terms of the level of income, um, our modelling does assume that income grows over the life cycle. And what we are either fixing or, or changing in these scenarios is the saving rate. Um, so over time, people's earnings will go up. Uh, in line uh, with, um, well, at an assumed rate that's the same across everybody in the economy. 
and therefore the amount of pounds that are going into a pension will be growing over time because they're saving the same proportion of their salary, but the salary is getting bigger and therefore more will be going into their pension um, from that point. So if people were able to increase their salary uh, by more than, than what we're modelling, that, that would be beneficial. Likewise, there are some people whose salary will grow less than what we're assuming because we have an average. Uh, and for those people, we might actually be overstating uh, how much they will have on retirement. Absolutely. That's great. Thanks, Rowena. And also just to react to a couple of comments on the chat, we will certainly make um, Rowena's slides available to attendees afterwards. Um, and um, we also make sure you've got a copy of the link to the full report. Thank you, Rowena, for that sort of whistle-stop tour through um, through what we found. Before I hand over to, to Stephen and then um, Nigel, I think what really strikes me in this work is quite frankly, just the sheer scale of the challenge um, challenge it poses for us. I think we can be rightly proud of some really significant interventions in this area over you know, recent years, the banning of the default retirement age, the introduction of author enrollment, you know, huge, huge, big um, potential interventions, but clearly even that um, is not remotely enough. I sometimes, in my working life, focused on longevity and what do we do about it? Think about how one could make parallels to the climate emergency and climate change um, in this space to draw attention to the scale, perhaps, uh, of the degree to which we need to be thinking so differently. And I wonder, Rowena, if you know, your suggestion, do we want to live in a society where everybody has an opportunity in retirement to have the minimum um, standard of living, have, have a decent standard of living um, in retirement? If that were our net zero, what are the big actions that we're going to really um, need to take and how challenging will they be? And it strikes me that 12%, saving 12%, working till 68, these are huge asks, as you said, um, to big chunks of the population. And they're very different to what people um, might be expecting. And for me, I think a few things are sort of obvious areas where we need to pay particular attention. One would be around skills and retraining and enabling many, many more people to increase their incomes and to enable longer working lives. So many people falling out of work before, well before the state pension age and that long-term trend of increased participation by, by people over 50, over 60 in the, in the workforce has taken a recent hit um, post-pandemic, a recent hit that, that we're still trying to, to understand and work out how to reverse. I also think that clearly implied in, in what we've done is the need for a strong enough safety net for those who are going to be unable to work longer um, or save more. The last time the state pension age rose from 65 to 66, the, the Treasury made, I think, a net saving of, of just under £5 billion. Pounds. And the net effect, while it did uh, nudge a few people, age 65, uh, into working that year longer, um, was actually to increase, you know, just simply to increase the rate of absolute poverty among people aged 65. So what if, for example, just a fraction of the value of a saving of that magnitude were invested in a much larger and more ambitious collaborative package of measures from government, from employers, um, from skills providers, from the financial services sector to much more radically support people over 50, over 60 um, to find and stay in good work. Is that the scale and the level of intervention, for, quite frankly, um, that's needed? And then finally, you mentioned it at the end, um, Rowena, the critical importance of, of engaging people more effectively in their future finances. And that being important for all of us, uh, not just those of us who can afford to save more. How important it is that we find much better ways of delivering the sorts of information and support that will help people actually make the connection in their minds between what they're doing now and what they may want to see for their future selves and what the implications um, of making any changes to their current life could be for their own futures. Just critical um, set of issues. Lots to dive into, hopefully. But let me pass on now to Stephen Evans, who, as I mentioned to you, is executive of the Learning and Work Institute, to particularly, Stephen, if I could ask you um, to think particularly about those issues around enabling more people to work longer. Over to you, Stephen. 
Great. Thanks, Catherine. And thanks for the invite to be part of today and discussing a really good piece of uh, research. I think um, sort of telling people that um, you've all got to work much longer and save much more or just accept you're going to be poorer is a uh, would be a policy conclusion that uh, I think Sir Humphrey and Yes Minister would describe as courageous um, so we kind of need to find need to find a different way don't we um, and so in that spirit I thought I'd just try and um, talk a little bit about three big challenges I think and then three opportunities to do something about it particularly around that area of working longer as you say. So we've got this we've got this short term crunch, which is um, that uh, we've got this weird situation in the labour market of really high vacancies. And yet employment is still around about 330,000 below pre pandemic levels. And the way you square that circle is that lots of people over the age of 50 and with long term health conditions have left the labour market altogether in the last couple of uh, years. Um, now, our research at the Learning and Work Institute shows that the UK is relatively unique in having that pattern. So we're the only country in the G7 that's uh, that's had this dropout of over 50s from, from the labour market. So our over 50s are either uniquely um, sick of work and wealthy enough not to worry about it compared to other countries or something's going awry. And the way I phrase that suggests where my answer is, is something's going awry. So I think we've got that kind of short term uh, crunch, which risks creating long term problems. Then we've got the bigger long term picture, which is what Phoenix Insights is looking at in all of your work. I know of uh, longer working lives, aging workforces. You know, it's great that we're all uh, in general uh, living longer, but we've got to be able to adapt to that change. So if we're working for longer, we're going to have 50 year careers. We're going to have to change role more often. The economy is going to change. We have to update our skills. We've actually got the opportunity to have multiple careers. You know, it's opportunities here, not just uh, not just challenges. Uh, and then actually the third one, I think, is a, is a real central issue to a lot of issues that we face in the country as a whole, which is that economic growth since 2008 has been, to coin a technical economics term, rubbish. <coughs> been diabolical um, and this is not inevitable because we're still our productivity is way lower than lots of other countries 30 percent lower than the us 20 percent lower than france and germany so there's lots of catching up we could do um, and if you don't have economic growth everything becomes a zero-sum game so you can either have spend some money now or you can have some money in retirement this group can have some or that group can have some you can have some public services or you can have tax cuts. Everything becomes at best a zero sum game. Um, we need to grow the economy. We need to grow wages. And then people will be better able to afford a decent standard of living now because we want them to have a decent standard of living throughout their lives, not just in retirement. And also saving a bit more becomes a more credible um, opportunity. Now, that's easier said than done, obviously. <clears throat> and um, I know the, the new... Um, Prime Minister is trying to focus on economic growth and we can have a debate about how, they, how, how she's going to do that. But ultimately, you've got to grow the economy, otherwise everything becomes a, a zero-sum game. So those are my kind of three challenges. They're quite easy ones to get through in the next half hour. Uh, three sort of areas of focus, I suppose, in trying to tackle them. So first is better support for retraining. We have a model for our benefit system and our skill system, which is still really set up on a, a model where you go to you go to school you have your education you leave it at 16 18 21 um, then you go off and you go and work um, and then you retire and that's that whereas actually the world isn't like that and um, particularly with longer working lives isn't going to be like that our skills funding focuses more money on those who are younger than those who are on older if you did you did your a levels or you did a level three apprenticeship or whatever in your <clears throat> when you were a teenager or in your 20s or whatever then you want to retrain when you come to your 40s or 50s or 60s. There's very little for you there. The government just says, well, you know, good luck, really. So we need to rethink that retraining model, I think, for that world of longer working lives, different careers, switching careers, that sort of thing. Um, second is, I think there's a big challenge for employers here as well. It's not just about the government um, having to step in and sort of stuff out. So, for example... Of the, um, of the over 50s that have dropped out of the labour market since the start of the pandemic, um, the Office for National Statistics found that I think 61% of those in their 50s 
um, said they were interested in coming back to work, but it had to be a job that suited them, available on a flexible basis and was in the sort of area that they were interested in. So how are employers going to go and find and attract um, that age group um, and that those people who aren't, have necessarily got some choices about what they want to do? So you've got to think about job design if you're an employer. Also, a lot of those who've left the labour market are not on traditional out-of-work unemployment-related benefits. And almost all of our support for people to find jobs is focused on those who are unemployed and on benefits. That's what the Job Centre focuses on. So we've got to find different ways to engage with this group and to attract them back to work uh, and for employers to, to recruit in different ways as well as looking at job design. So I think it's a big challenge for employers here. Um, and then last point, really, last opportunity is about support and advice. So the world was complicated enough to start with and it's getting ever more complicated, I think. We did a pilot a few years ago of um, midlife career reviews for people round and about the age of uh, 50. About 3,000 people took part, engaged through housing associations, union learn, um, careers advisors, lots, lots of different sources. And first of all, we found real latent interest. Lots of people said, oh, I can't believe someone wants to talk to me about this. This is, this is great. And careers advice was something that if it had happened at all, had happened at school. Um, but the idea of kind of seeing these things in the round and looking at your finances, what do you want to do? Um, what are your options? What are your work options? How can you reskill? This was a sort of conversation no one really had, and they were really keen to do it. Um, second thing we found was that um, who does it is really important. So there was kind of, uh, we did got some employers delivering these reviews, and there was a bit of a bit of a challenge because when you called in for a career review by your employer, it kind of sounds like um, it's going to be a slightly negative conversation. So, so kind of how you engage people and who engages people is really important. But off the back of it, we found loads of increases in confidence, people thinking more about managing their finances, people recognising opportunities ahead. There was a real latent demand and, and real um, positive outcomes from this. So how do we do more of that? I know the uh, financial services industry is doing some of it, job centres are. How can we do more of that? So some really big challenges, really interesting bit of research, and hopefully that highlights a few areas where I think we can make some real steps forward with policy. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. Lots to get into. Let me pass straight on um, to Nigel. Nigel People, Director of Policy and Advocacy at the PLSA. Can I ask you to focus in your um, reactions to this new research, in particular to this challenge of supporting people, if they can, to save more? Over to you, Nigel. Yeah, OK. Um, uh, thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, I'd just like to join everyone else is saying what a great piece of research it is, capturing lots of complex issues all uh, in one place. Uh, and that's one of the problems with retirement saving, isn't it? It's the fact that it touches many different areas. And the result of that is often it's too hard for the politicians and maybe the policymakers um, to be able to solve it in one go, because there's all these other little bits getting in on the act and it makes it difficult to deal with. Um, yeah, it's very helpful to see this assessment and, 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 you know, not at all welcome to see a confirmation that many people are under saving for retirement. Uh, the PLSA back in 2016 uh, did a piece of research called Retirement Income Adequacy, and we compared pension saving against the Pensions Commission target replacement rates and against what we now pleasantly talk of as the PLSA uh, RLS minimum level, um, and at that, that time, we found only about half of people were on track uh, for their target replacement rate. And that's including DB and DC, public sector pensions, as well as private sector pensions. Um, and only 3% of DC savers were on track to achieve those things. So the work today, unfortunately, is confirming that's the case. Uh, and so the real challenge is what we're going to all do about it. If I may, I'm just going to take one tiny segue, because I think it's probably relevant and interesting to everyone, about the retirement living standards. Um, and it's just to say these are based on entirely independent research carried out by Loughborough University with the British public, talking to people from across the four countries of the United Kingdom. And the three levels, which are roughly 10, 20, 30, um, they are based on the views of the British public, and they're not not PLSA's view, 
And I think that's quite important when we're thinking about what's the minimum, what's moderate and what's comfortable. And even the terminology is based on the views of the British people rather than sort of, you know, my own sort of views for how to describe these lifestyles. But anyway, so it's just a little segue there. Um, addressing the point, um, can we engage people more effectively to increase pension saving? Well, um, I'm sure we can. And I'm sure, as the report finds, that pensions dashboards will help in that because everyone can see all their pensions in one place. And as we know, perhaps it will lead to some consolidation as well, which, again, will break it easier for people to grasp how much money they have. But unless those dashboards include some indication of the target lifestyles in retirement, it's, it's not going to help very much. So it's really, really important um, for engagement purposes that dashboards include you know, ideally the retirement living standards, but or other targets uh, to help bring home to people uh, what kind of lifestyle they get at the moment and whether they want to make an adjustment to their savings level. But I do think there's a danger of us all in pensions world of having a sort of collective amnesia of the of the policy in this area, because some of you, I hope very few of you are as old as I am and remembers working on this in the 90s, uh, like 30 years ago, uh, and, and early part of, of this century, um, when everyone felt that, you know, stakeholder pensions, um, they're great, they're low cost, they're easy to understand. I'm sure everyone starts saving in them and saving at the right level. And of course, it wasn't working. They set up the Pensions Commission and they said, no, 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 really, we need to do more than just leave it to voluntarism and individuals getting very clever. We need to help people with a good, strong nudge, shove in the back, through automatic enrolment. So we've, and then the UK introduced automatic enrolment. It's worked fabulously well. The drop opt out rates are tiny, the cessation rates are tiny. People from all around the world come to the UK to study automatic enrolment. But we in this country um, are not building on our success of automatic enrolment. And really, what I wanted to say is that engagement is hugely important and there's much to be done but do you know what it'd be a lot easier if you just pushed up automatic enrollment a little bit higher perhaps that 12 percent might need to think about the people on low incomes as rowena was highlighting people on you know less than 20k but really generally speaking a little bit more of a shove up in standard um pension saving would be a good idea and i expect lots of the people on this call know that all the research shows that people assume that the level they're automatically enrolled in is the right level. Pensions are sorted because the government set up a 8% of band earnings. So, you know, really, I think there's actually a bit of a responsibility on us um, to call this out. Um, on the question of uh, encouraging saving for those who can afford it, um, well, obviously, I've talked about uh, the value of pushing up a, but I do really like the finding um, in the report about changing the narrative. Um, now, this is always very, this is very difficult for us, isn't it? Because we're all so pleased that the scope of pension saving is increasing, that more people are in AE, you know, and more people are saving. And that's great. That's really great. But we don't want to put people off. We don't want to, we don't want to tell people that the pension you're going to get rather small. And I think that's part of the problem is that we, we do need to get a dose of more realism into whether the 8% AE band earnings is enough. And, and as, as I'm sure, again, everyone on the call will know, because band earnings excludes the first sort of six and a half thousand pounds of person's salary, many people on quite low income, so in automatic enrollment, because they earn more than 10,000 pounds a year, are actually only saving on quite a small bit of their income. So is it any wonder we're getting like 20% of people not even achieving the RLS minimum level, which is about £11,000 a year? So, so I do think changing the narratives, right, it needs to be done very carefully in a quite a targeted way. I think having dashboards, retirement living standards will help. But it seems to me from this research, it might be that there's some messages about people on middle and high incomes being told to think carefully about whether they might want to go not just beyond 8%, but beyond 12%. And think about that 12 to 20%, especially maybe in later life, when traditionally people have cleared some of their debts and, and, and maybe paid for their kids. Now, obviously, we all know now that there's a new problem that even the 
roughly two thirds of people who own their own home will not necessarily have paid off their mortgages later in life. So there's a there's a double challenge there and people having kids later. So there's a third challenge there. But there's probably no other kind of way um, out of this than sort of people accepting save a bit more and maybe spend a bit less for the middle to high earners um, in later life. Um, a fourth thing that I thought was sorry, I think. The fourth recommendation, which I thought was a, a really good one, was talking about the creation of a safety net. And I love the diplomatic language, the reimagining of the state pension. Very good. Um, it's very good. Um, but again, you can't help thinking with this large numbers of people not even achieving the, the you know, the RLS minimum, the sort of 11,000 a year. You do wonder whether the state pension is fit for purpose. Now, we know our state pension, the new state pension, um, is one of the lowest in the OECD. Uh, and it is, of course, flat rate. Uh, so it doesn't go up in line with earnings. So it's doing a great job. It's really good. It's got carer credits in there for people who are you know, looking after kids, looking after parents. That, that's great. But it isn't quite right. And we in the private pensions world have tended to spend a lot of time, understandably, thinking about what's the role that private pensions can play in solving this. But the, I do think it's a helpful thing to, to highlight the role um, the state pension has to play on this. Um, and then finally, on the sort of, if I if you don't mind me slightly going beyond my brief there, Catherine, beyond the pension saving bit, the other assets bit, very important, uh, again, which you draw out about, you know, are there in housing assets? Or will there be inheritances to ride to the rescue? Um, and you know, it's a bit frustrating. If you look at the Sunday press, there's always this question, property or pensions? And nine people out of 10 say property. Uh, at least these are the very successful people who get interviewed in the Sunday in, in the Sunday press. Um, however, when you look at the stats on property wealth, um, uh, and as alluded to by Rowena, um, it probably isn't going to be the answer for the vast majority of people. And there's uh, two reasons for this. One, Roughly speaking, um, the average capital that a person has who owns a home, which is, as I said, it's it's, it's about, I won't go to all the, try and remember all the stats right now, but it is roughly about 65, 70%, I think, of the population that owns their own home. So for the renters, they don't get this help at all. But for the uh, home owners, they're looking on average, on average, at about 100K of capital each, maybe a little bit above that. Now, um, that's lovely, 100K. But remember, you're going to be living on average for 20 plus years in retirement and you still need somewhere to live. You still need a house or a flat to live in. And whilst equity release products may be part of that solution, typically they tend to only allow you to take a, a portion of the asset value of the house. I think it's 30, 40 percent. And again, so you get your 100K down to 30K. And then if you're thinking about 20 plus years in retirement, maybe that doesn't make such a big difference. I think the property wealth will be helpful for upper half um, by income and wealth of the population, and especially the top 10%, but probably less, for, well, non-existent for those outside of that group. Um, and then the other thing which Rowena did talk about was that often the people with the good pensions also have the good properties, and they also, so I get my finger there, and they also get the inheritances. Um, and, you know, again, I've seen some figures that show inheritances on average are very small, they're a few thousand pounds. Um, so... I think what this leads us to conclude is that uh, the notions around working longer, getting reskilled, staying in the workforce, um, and saving more if you can afford it are very necessary. I think it's really important that we as a sector try and pull together and we highlight where we're saying similar things, because in reality, at the moment, we're all saying slightly different things, and it makes it hard for the decision makers and politicians to listen and, and, and take account of us. Um, but it's really important to emphasise where we're saying about the same thing. And my final comment is just that I don't think um, uh, we should despair. Um, because on the one hand, every little helps, to quote a certain commercial. So every little helps and will make a difference. And secondly, I think we need to also think about um, those who will come after us. You know, so uh, I don't want to get too, too, too profound there, but I'm particularly thinking, you know, young people who are joining the system now, if we get the system right for them, then at least we can, they'll be okay. Uh, so that's probably about upping AE. And in the meantime, we just need to be looking at these other levers to pull to help for all of those of us currently in the workforce. So thanks very much.
Thanks very much, Nigel. That's super. Now, let me then um, field some questions um, to you all from um, from our audience. We've had lots um, of really interesting ones. A, a quick one, if I may, to Rowena first. Um, really, a, an invitation for you to speculate, Rowena. Um, given that this research was based on speaking to people pre the depths of the cost of living crisis. What thoughts do you have on how big an impact changes since then could be having on what we've found? Rowena, do, do unmute yourself. Sorry, rookie error. Um, as, as I was just saying, it was a great question. Um, the research that we've done uses um, costs to achieve those baskets of goods and services that people aspire to um, based in, I think, 2021 prices. And we've seen prices change quite considerably since then. Um, but given that this analysis is quite long term focused, um, the big question is how long those price uh, hikes will persist for, whether this is a particular on the energy side, whether this is a short term blip or whether it's something that's going to be sustained for the long term. Um, but clearly, to the extent that things cost more to buy than we anticipated, um, that means that the income you need to provide yourself with a given standard of living in retirement will now be higher than it was. Um, whether or not that will feed directly through in the short term into how much people expect they need uh, is a slightly different question. But they will make, you know, it will make um, providing for yourself in retirement more expensive as well as making it harder to put that money aside today. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Rowena. Another question next about uh, pension of poverty and the adequacy of our social security safety net. We've always assumed, says the question, that earnings grow faster than inflation, but in the past 20 years, real earnings growth has fallen behind the standard of living, especially for the low paid. Do we need to accept that the benefit system needs to be reinforced to reduce pension of poverty? And let me respond to that one by saying, I was um, speaking to a group of young labor activists um, not long ago, who were all vociferous in their opposition to policies like the triple lock. And I found myself reminding them to not say old when they mean rich, to not conflate the two um, and talk about benefits for older people as being benefits automatically for richer people. Because actually, I feel like we may find ourselves in decades to come reflecting that we were living in quite a bubble when older populations uh, were relatively uh, richer um, than younger ones. And to be old, the idea that in generations gone by, that to be old was to be poor may be an experience we find ourselves again um, in future. Let me put a question next, though, to, to you, Stephen, um, about the role of employers in increasing rates of saving, just to join our two strands of working longer and saving more um, together. So this is the question, as with the cost of energy being burdened on the consumer rather than the profits of the energy companies, how can we persuade more employers to co contribute more to their employees' pensions rather than their focus on profits? Have we got the balance right in our model between individuals taking the responsibility for themselves and the role of employers and, of course, the state. What do you think, Stephen? Well, and by the way, if, if you think pensions are relatively low as a state pensions are relatively low as a proportion of average incomes, I invite you to take a look at universal credit for working age people. There's, there's a general issue about um, um, inequality and insecurity, I think, which then echoes down the generations. Um, um, so I think there's a broader issue about um, um, more robust safety net um, and, and benefit system. I, I guess it's specific to answer the actual question that, that you asked me, though, um, I mean, it's, I don't think you can persuade employers to put more in and have lower profits. You can't persuade them to do that. Ge generally, what happens on, with these sort of non-payroll things, whether it's pension contributions or national insurance, or whatever, is that they feed through into lower take-home pay for people. So, you know, people, employers are going to pay a certain amount and it's, you either get it um, you either get it now or you get it uh, in a retirement fund. But what you can do is to effectively regulate the economy and to set the right incentives for employers. Um, 
So this is one of the interesting things about the current situation, for example, you use the energy company example, but uh, um, you know, the governor of the Bank of England, who I think may, I can't remember, maybe on about three quarters of a million a year, I think. So he was encouraging workers to ameliorate their wage demands to keep inflation down, um, but didn't give the same exaltation to some businesses like um, some of the some of the UK based energy companies. I, I fear we're not going to persuade um, Russian based energy companies to ameliorate their profits for us. But um and um, so I think there's a general issue about how we how we regulate the economy and how we set incentives for employers that then feeds through into lower investment in capital infrastructure, uh, low investment in skills by employers. Their investment in skills has fallen 28 percent since 2005. And um, in 2005, I was writing reports moaning it was too low then. Um, and also um, the sort of benefits they provide to employees. So I don't think you can persuade employers to 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 do more and accept lower profits as a result. But I think you can regulate the economy, set the right incentives um, and and get better results at the end. Thanks, Stephen. Nigel, I wonder if you'd like to come in on that question. Yeah, um, so I I would hope that we might be able to persuade employers to want to put more towards the pension part of the remuneration package. Um, But I sort of see this in labour market terms in the sense that if individuals, workers, valued their pension more and made it clear this is the thing they really value and it's a tool for the employer to recruit and retain. If we can make that joined up, then we can work within even the existing financial envelope. And I can see Stephen nodding, which is very encouraging. Even within the existing financial envelope um, to, to, to maybe get a slightly larger portion uh, being paid by the employer. And just a sort of gratuitous comment, really, not not directly in answering your question. You know, we all know we come from a world where the employer paid two thirds on average of defined benefit pensions go back 20 years and one third for the employee. Um, but now that got reversed with automatic enrolment. So I kind of feel employers are getting um, workers quite cheaply in terms of their contribution to pension saving. Um, Many employers are very enthusiastic about this, enthusiastic about this, larger employers, you know, especially with a workforce that stays with them for a long time. But others, of course, are working at the statutory minimum of automatic enrolment. Thanks, Nigel. And while I've got you, another question asking for um, your position on the Living Pension Initiative, the latest concept from the Living Wage Foundation, clearly relevant here. Yeah, no, well, I'm I'm uh, lucky to be an advisor to the Living Pension uh, Initiative. And so I think it's a good thing. Um, just like I was saying earlier, Catherine, um, there are many there are many sort of competing and different ideas in the pensions world as to how to solve the problem of pensions adequacy. Um, and it's really important that we all lend each other support as much as we can. So so, for, you know, we at the PLSA, we've been offering the pension quality mark specifically to address your last point, um, which is about uh, giving employers who offer a high value pension scheme something to kind of be proud about and tell their staff about. Arguably, that's, you know, a a preceding concept from uh, 13 years ago, um, which is still going strong. Um, And I might be tempted to say, well, I don't need a living pension because that's confusing. We've already got the pension quality, we've got retirement living status. But I think the truth is we all need to pull together and do anything we can to highlight and encourage uh, pension savings so that people, you know, avoid having, you know, a a miserable retirement. Thanks, Nigel. Stephen, let me come to you um, next. Some comments about uh, midlife career reviews and your experience on on the evaluation that you did of earlier models, um, earlier models of those. There's clearly some innovation, as you as you alluded to, in this space at the moment. Companies um, in my sector, like Phoenix and, and others, are investing in this idea of a midlife MOT, both for staff and, and for customers. There are social entrepreneurs like the community interest company Brave Starts offering, um, offering a way in for people to begin to think about this. You, you alluded there also to this question of who delivers this advice? Where can people get it? What are the right trusted sources um, for advice like this? Where do you think um, the future might lie um, for those of us interested in supporting more people in adult life, in midlife, to think for a moment in a supported way about 
their future career, their savings, um, and what opportunities they might have to reskill, to upskill, to retrain, to develop their earning potential for the rest of what could still be uh, several decades more working. Yes, I, well, I think the perhaps the first thing to say is that um, uh, you can't necessarily get a single advisor who knows all of these things. Like, you know, pensions is complicated enough to understand on its own without also adding in what's going on in the labour market, the skill system and the housing situations, all this, that and the other. So you kind of need somebody who's able to hold the piece, has obviously got some expertise, but also can draw in um, relevant, more detailed expertise in some of those other sectors um, as and when it's uh, needed. So I think almost my view would be you kind of need a network almost of um, of advisors or advisory um, um, support. Um, and then who who's well placed to do that? I guess so. Our experience um, running this um, this program a few years ago was that um, the, the phrase that often crops up. I'm not sure it means anything really, but it was trusted intermediary. So, for example, um, housing associations. A lot of people kind of felt like if they if they got a letter from the housing association or someone knocked on the door, that kind of felt official and not somebody who's just trying to flog you something. Um, uh, I was kind of in two minds about get a letter. I, I worried a letter from a council might go in the bin, but actually, because oh god, uh, but actually a lot of people sort of trusted um, this coming from their council and also tailoring messages. So for some people it was, do you want to earn more? For some people it was, do you want to change? For some people it was, um, um, do you want a bit of a stock take? I guess so. I guess tailoring some of that messaging for different groups as well. Um, union learning representatives, um, we had to tell them to stop recruiting people at one point because we'd run out of capacity. So, so actually, union learning reps did, did a great job in, in some of that as well. So I'd say it's all lots of those trusted intermediaries. Um, I haven't mentioned the, the career service, but we did do some work with the National Career Service. I guess they're going to know one aspect of it. That's the kind of challenge, really. Um, so I, I would say that network of trusted intermediaries, but able and with the relationships to pull in particular bits of expertise as and when they're re required. And of course, the financial services industry, I know lots of pension companies and others are doing, uh, including I'm sure Phoenix as well, are doing some, some really great work on this too. Thanks, Stephen, that's fantastic. Well, I'm conscious of time and I, I don't want to uh, allow us to run over. I'm sure lots of people on the call have got two o'clock um, calls to get to. So thank you so much to our panelists, Rowena Crawford, Stephen Evans and Nigel People, really appreciate your, your contributions um, this afternoon. Keep in touch, please, uh, with Phoenix Insights and our ongoing programme of work. Uh, we'll be here for the long term, working with you and others to try and address some of these wicked problems we've identified in this report and catalyse the kind of action that is needed if we're going to do some of the things we discussed today, expanding auto-enrolment, strengthening the safety net, re rethinking our, our national adult training model, improving information and engagement for savers. That's our agenda. And if it's yours too, do keep in touch. Thank you so much, everybody. And I'll say bye-bye.